Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show, number 38 this week. Coming up on the show, we check out the new White Industries Micro Spline Hub. We look at the new WTB Ranger tie and that new 29 inch size. We have a look at the very first fork from Paul Turner, that's the RockShox RS1 to you and me. And of course, there's all the great content from you guys. Okay, so let's jump straight into news. And first up, Transition Bikes, their component range, Anvil components, have got a brand new pedal out. It's called the Tilt. It's 17 millimeters thick. It's a full CNC machined arc, so it's got a nice sort of concave profile to it. Uh, the way it's manufactured, of course, CNC machined. It's 105 millimeters by 105, so nice and square on there. Uh, pins, all the stuff that you need. And quite cool, if you ever look at it on screen, is it's marketed around working with any shoes. So their tongue-in-cheek marketing is pretty funny. Transition are famous for doing quite a lot of quirky videos. And their marketing there is around 41-year-old Jimmy who rides in a, what looks like a pair of New Balance running shoes. And if it works on his shoes, apparently it will work on any shoes. So there's two oversized bearings, there's an inboard DU bushing on there, uh, chrome white axles, and basically they just look really good. And as with all transition stuff, I think they're gonna be really good as well, so make sure you check those out. Next bit of tech news, of course, is the brand new GoPro Hero 7 has just been announced and launched. In fact, I've got one right here. In fact, this one belongs to Blake. Uh, I've just stolen this off his desk so I can have a look at it. Now, this thing has got some very cool features. Of course, the first thing that really jumps to mind is the fact that it's got live streaming on it. So that's gonna work with Facebook Live. And it's also got a few other very cool features on there to keep up with the modern times. And one of them, of course, is portrait mode. So that's gonna be really good if you like filming for Instagram stories and all that sort of stuff. If you have a look on screen now, you'll see some very cool images of the product itself. I said to Blake I wouldn't get it out because I know he wants to unpackage this himself. So it shoots 4K at 60 frames a second. It's 10 meters waterproof. Of course, it has voice control on there, and I think that feature has been improved on these as well. And it's ultra stabilizations. Of course, the footage on the GoPro website looks incredible, but the real test will be sticking this on Blake and seeing what we come up with. Um, it's also got a super photo mode, which sort of processes the images for you. It looks a bit like an HDR processing you get on regular cameras, but Again, very cool and is optimized around using with your devices too now. So I'm sure these are gonna be super popular and I reckon these are gonna be really good for GoPro because of course there were some issues with those Karma drones and I think this might bring it back to the top again. Next up is news of the new WTB Ranger tire. Now this tire is an interesting one because it used to be available as a plus size tire and now it's a dedicated 29 by 2.4 inch. Now it's optimized around wider rims, so it means the volume of the tire is able to handle that without getting too square. And it's available in various different carcasses. So look on screen now, you can see various different versions. Of course, the tread design is the same on all of them. So there's two models in the TCS, which is a tubeless compatible system, two models in the light casing. And the light casing itself is 60 threads per inch or TPI. And it has a slash guard, which is like a beautiful sort of insert on the sidewalls there to give them a little bit more protection. Now they come in fast rolling and high grip models, of course that refers to the compound of the rubber. And there's also the TCS Tough, which has got two layers of that 60 TPI casing to make them really, really very durable. Now they're also the TCS system on there, that sort of tubeless compatible system, it's in the second generation now, so it's much more reliable, inflates quicker, all of the rest of the stuff that you need for that. And there's a new Tritec compound, so it's a triple compound. The base of the tire has a hard compound, the main tread has medium compound and the shoulders have a soft compound. So basically you're getting the maximum there, you're getting the support from that underneath. So you're getting the best of all three worlds there. Of course, like a hard compound tire is gonna give you all the support you need and it's gonna be very durable, but it will never give you as much grip, especially in demanding conditions. So you want the soft compound on the shoulders to give you maximum cornering grip. You want that medium compound for your traction, but you don't want it to wear out too fast, which it would if you had a soft on there. And of course, a hard base gives it a nice bit of support, so it won't squirm around too much like full soft compound tires can do. Kind of similar to the Maxxis 3C principle, and that works very well. So we've got high expectations for the WTB Ranger. Now it comes in black wool and it also comes in a really cool gum wool color, which I just think is the coolest, uh, especially for WTB. It's slightly browner than others. Other brands look a bit more like a skin wool color. The gum wool looks really cool and it matches your vans if you wear those too. So uh, that's another reason to, to like them, I guess. 
And of course, the final thing, which is probably the first thing that WTB will tell you, is it was originally designed as a wet weather tire. It's quite an open tread on there, but actually they found it works really well in all conditions. They're not kind of branding it as a wet weather tire, although it was originally designed as such. Now, recently we checked out the brand new XTR drivetrain. Of course, the rear hub itself was one of the most special parts of that with that silent clutch mechanism on the inside and their brand new micro spline system they developed specially so that they could house their 12 speed system. Now, they did hint that other hub manufacturers will be bringing them out. We've already seen DT have one, but now if you look on screen, you'll see the White Industries have got one. Now, White Industries, we've shown this hub off at Interbike, which is now a new location, it used to be at Vegas, it's now at Reno. Um, and the hub itself from White Industries are a very trick cycling manufacturer, and I think it's gonna be a super high demand one. But it also makes me wonder, who's gonna be next? Uh, it won't be Chris King, I wouldn't have thought, because Chris King likes to do things a little slowly, take the time, they like to make sure things are designed the way that they want to launch them before they release them. But uh, I think you're gonna see a whole number of different micro spline hubs coming out, which I think is cool, because the XTR one is fantastic, but not everyone wants to take advantage of that really cool stealthy tech that XTR has. So uh, what would you have, the White Industries or the XTR? Let us know in those comments underneath. Uh, curious, I'd probably go for the XTR just based on the silent, of, uh, of the silence of it, which I probably wouldn't have said a few years back, but now that I've actually tried one, I think it sounds amazing having a completely silent bike. Noise or not noise. And finally, just another thing, also I spotted on Instagram, courtesy of Interbike this year, was from Paul's Components. Now, Paul's Component is really famous for making their rear derailleur, for making their love levers, the brake levers, their brakes, all this sort of CNC machined retro trickery stuff. Now, they've just announced this, which might make a lot of you laugh, so it's a seat quick release lever and a collar but it's probably one of the most beautiful ones I've ever seen, and if you are building a sort of a retro modern bike or you simply don't need a dropper post, I'm sure there are a few of you out there that don't want dropper posts, that is the collar you want on your bike. I think it's just a work of art. Absolutely lovely. Okay, now it's time for bike build. And of course, I know that you guys will probably know about this from the video that went live yesterday, where I did a pro bike check of that bike, and we are in fact giving the bike away. Uh, this was my intention from the beginning, which is why I wanted to know what you guys would pick to put on that bike, seeing as it was for you in the first place. So of course, it's that Santa Cruz Nomad. You can see it on screen now. I think you'll agree whether a Nomad is your first choice of bike or not, it looks Badass, it's a really cool bike. It's a one-off, it's a size large, so if it's not your size, maybe leave the competition for your mates to enter and tell them about it. It's a really easy competition to enter. It does involve having to make a little short video, but the video is not like making an edit. It doesn't involve having to have a good bike or a good camera. You can do this on your phone. We just wanna know about you. So make sure you click the link below the video, and also the link is at the bottom of this page in the description. Click that link, follow the instructions if you want to enter, it's very simple. And basically tell us about yourself, why you want to win this bike and how it would improve your life. That is it, it's that simple. And then we'll pick up the process from there. And we will post the bike anywhere. So, good luck. And now it's time for Bike Cave. Of course, this is the section of the show where we get to look at where you store your bikes, where you put them to bed at night, where you tinker with them and you fix them and all that stuff. So make sure you continue to send yours in. We love seeing them. The link to the uploader, just at the bottom of the screen there. And it's also in the description below this video. So first up, and I've already had a good look at this picture, is a great entry from Braden in Illinois. So. The first thing I'm gonna say about this, which I absolutely love, is the fact it's a GMBM water bottle on the back there using it to hold cable ties. Absolute winner. And it looks like you've got a massive tub of industrial swarf eager in there as well, which I like. Um, so, just moved into my first apartment and extremely lucky to have a storage room. Instead of storing junk, I, choose to, uh, I chose to build a new bike cave. I'm excited to be able to build, fix, prep my bikes in the new shop. Hope you enjoy it. Yep, yeah, nice workbench, nice tool chests there. In fact, everything's looking good. I don't think Martin would appreciate the angle of your tools on the pegboard, but it does look very neat, so we'll let you off on that one. I like in the bike collection as well, so you've got Weeder People 20 inch BMX. That is a, it's an NS sort of cross bike of some kind, all murdered out black, that looks pretty rad. Liking like the race face rims on there, pretty sweet. I love the pallet as well, by the way, that's a real cool idea. So I mounted a pallet vertically up on the wall there and using it to slot the wheels into, that's, that's really cool. Um, yeah, diamond back as well, looking good. 
Loving it. Next to the uh, GMBM bottle on the back there, you've got another bottle cage, but this one's just to uh, hold your beer. That's pretty good. Does it like a fit a bigger beer in there though, to be fair? So I think you might want to uh, up the ante there. Nice, well, thank you for that, Braden. That is looking sweet. Loving the sort of, uh, the very black and white look you got in there with just enough color from your pot tools work stand. Looking sweet. Um, next up is from Jim. Uh, Jim is in Denmark. Hi, Dolly, this is my submission for Bike Cave. My mobile bike cave, as you can see in the pictures, I've got my park tools, my stand and table all uh, quite easily mobile. My girlfriend let me have some of our share to store everything and in the dark months uh, I can work in there but it's not that easy so I tend to work outside in the garden. Yeah, I would do that as well. Uh, nice retro mongoose eye book as well. That's quite a tidy looking example, you've looked after that too. It's looking really nice. Loving the little mobile table there, I've got one of those. Super useful for when you're doing jobs, you just want to have all your tools on it right by the bike. Um, obviously great for you because you can work outside as well as inside. You definitely like parks, don't you? You've got the work stand, you've got the track pump there, or floor pump, as some people call them. But wicked setup, I really like that. It's a good idea as well, having a setup that you can take out and work outside, but I'd be quite happy myself actually with that little workbench, it looks smart. I like the fact it's in a wooden shed as well, you've got a window to peep out of. Looking good, nice setup. Oh, now there's the toolbox, that is winning all the way. So you've got cable pullers in there, bottom bracket tool, park mallet, allen keys, screwdrivers, ATD1, what's that, a 1.2. Yeah, plenty of cool stuff in there. Nice, looks like you've got most things in there. See some bleeding blocks as well for you doing your brakes and some spoke keys. Nice setup. Oh, and there it is in action out the back. So you've got your wheel out of your cube and doing some maintenance work. Looking good, thanks Jim for sending that in, that's really cool. So don't forget people, you can be alternative with this stuff, it doesn't actually have to have a bike cave, it could just be where you work on your bike. For some people that is outside, and this is a really cool one. Nice one. Oh, and we're out the bike cave for this week. Please continue to get your entries into us, we love seeing them, however small they are, or however massive and crazy they are. It might not even be your bike cave, it could be your local bike shop, in fact, or it could be a friend's workshop on the back of his van. Let us, let us know, send them in. All right, now it's time for Rewind, which is our retro part of the show. So we like to tell stories about where products have come from, where they're going, the history of mountain biking, all that sort of stuff. And we love seeing stuff from you. Maybe you've got some photos of some of your original bikes that you first started riding on. Maybe you've got some old componentry, whatever it is, even race photos, send it all in. The older, the better. Um, when I say retro, it really needs to be sort of uh, before, I'd say before 2000 to sort of get into that class because anything else is just old rather than retro. But uh, keep them coming into the address at the bottom of the screen and the link is in the description below. So this week we've just got one entry and we've had quite a few but this one's really cool. It's a collection of carpool bikes from Mike in Salt Lake City. So this is really cool. So the original Carpool uh, VRS, and Carpool, in case you don't know, are actually the bikes made famous by Josh Bender when he used to jump off those massive cliffs. Like literally, 60 foot drops used to do with a custom Carpool with a ridiculous fork with like 12 inch travel and a double shock setup. But anyway, uh, back to this one. So uh, this bike represents the birth of the many stories in the history of mountain biking. I hope you give it some special consideration on your show because I believe it's designer, engineer, and builder deserves a place in the mountain biking hall of fame. Hey, that's a good shout. Um, I'm just gonna read this word for word. This is sort of some really good information in here. This bike in red was one of the first three hand built by Jan, uh, Jan or Jan uh, Carpio back in 1994 here in Salt Lake City. One was for him, one was for me, so for Mike, uh, and the third was sold to White Pine Touring in Park City. They were produced together so there were no serial numbers. While I had only three inches of travel, my personal opinion was it's technological way ahead of the competition, which coincidentally had about the same amount of travel. Uh, to start, the pivot point was on the chain line, so it climbed very well, no Trek Pogo or Mongoose Amp bobbing. Uh, but the pivot point is where the similarity between this bike and the Proflex and San Andreas ended. Both of those competitors offered a swing arm pushing directly onto an elastomer shock. Meanwhile, the Carpeel had a sophisticated linkage, so single pivot linkage driven, um, that gave it a rising rate against a spring, uh, a spring coil oil shock. Um, it's easy to see how small bumps were absorbed as the link rose upward, pushing more directly against the shock as it went deeper into the travel. Thus, I never really felt it bottoming out. In addition, by loosening the pinch bolts that held the circular mount of the linkage to the swing arm, 
uh, basically you could adjust the geometry and adjust the BB height and steepness and slackness of head and seat angles. All this in 1994. I agree with you, dude. I think that's a really, really forward-thinking bike. And, and actually the design, even though the frame side, you know, it looks a bit a bit short these days and it's quite tall, really long head tube on there, but the actual back end of the bike doesn't look really that out of date. It looks quite good. While the VRS was a fantastic bike, its floor was swing arm flex. So a year or so later, um, they made upgrades to these bikes when rectangular tubing became available. The cross section went from a barbell to a rectangle with ribs running down the middle, like this one here. Uh, Cooker, Maguro, Boe, and Look came on board as new sponsors for Jan and I. Um, we made a switch to the new Judy DH forks, swapping the elastomers out for metal springs and oil cartridges. Man, I love your attention to detail on this. This is really good stuff. Uh, the red frame got a repaint to black and the answer stem got repainted to the same color red as the Judy. Believe it or not, the black bike pictured is the same bike as the red one. Today it's 24 years old, hanging in my garage, and it's still rideable. That is super cool. Unfortunately for um, like many small custom builders, um, they're forced to bootstrap the entire operation from the beginning, uh, having to rely on sales to pay past debts. Uh, the larger the company grew, the larger the debts grew, eventually forcing, forcing them to bankrupt the business. Oh, I'll move back to Poland. That's a really shame. Um, I miss his crazy zest for life and hope someday he, along with his new wife and son, make it back to the States. Dude, this is such a cool story and really nice pictures as well. And like you said, that linkage is well ahead of its time. Um, very cool. And that looks like um, it was the same sort of shock setup you used to see on the GT RTS bikes that uh, pierces through the base of the seat tube there. Nice setup on that actually, that looks really good. Looking good, oh man, this is a super good one. Thank you for sending these images in. And please continue to send in pictures and stories about retro stuff. And alternatively, if there's stuff you want to know, feel free to ask us some questions. We'll do a bit of homework and we'll tell you some really cool stories and we'll try and source the right images if I haven't actually got those products to show you. Uh, we have got quite a lot of retro stuff and we've got good access from friends. So feel free to ask away and we'll see what we can do. Okay, now it's time for Top Mods, which of course is a section of the show where you get to send in all the pictures of the cool stuff you've been upgrading and modifying on your own bikes. Whatever it is, whatever customizations you've made to make your bike yours and different from all the others, send it in, we love it. Even if it's just a little top cap or a pair of grips, all of those little things count and they really do set your own bike apart from all your friends. So use the uploader, send your pictures in and tell us what you're doing. Video entries are encouraged as well. We wanna see you guys in action and we wanna be communicating with you. So send them in. Anyway, first up this week is from Stephen in Bangor, Northern Ireland. Um, and it's a Trek Roscoe 8. Hi Dolly, Stephen from Northern Ireland here. Uh, thanks for featuring my shed on Bike Cave. I was super stoked to get on the show. Nice. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I thought I'd recognise your name. Um, thought I'd send you some of the mods I've done to the bike in the shed over the last year. The first is a picture of the bike on the day I bought it, which came with Schwalbei 2.8 Rocket Rons, which I found pretty slow rolling. So I changed these to WTB Trail Boss 2.4s, which I set up tubeless. Nice. Considering putting the 2.8s back on for winter. Well, I guess you could. The advantage with big 2.8s is you can lower that pressure and you get a bigger surface contact there. So of course you're gonna get traction, but at the same time, if your local mud is quite thick and claggy, it's actually gonna attract more mud and clog up areas on the bike. So it can kind of go both ways. Personally, with local mud, I tend to go a little bit thinner and a gnarlier tire, so it cuts through the mud to the harder stuff underneath. Uh, but it's gotta work for you, whatever it is. So definitely good consideration there. I made one or two minor upgrades every month pretty much as I could afford, mostly aimed at storing everything I need to on the bike so I can ride packless for shorter rides. Of course, that's the fashion, everyone loves doing it, it makes perfect sense. Um, I've got Topeak Multi-Tool, CO2 cartridge and inflator, SRAM Master Link, nice, and Pedro's tie lever wrapped in a spare tube and strapped on with a BCR race strap. A spare CO2 and a tubeless repair kit in the fork cork uh, on a steerer tube and some fix-it sticks. Uh, stowed in behind a fabric cageless bottle. These are surplus to requirements now, but I like them. Yeah, why not? Uh, other upgrades include a cable spiral to tidy the cockpit. Yeah, that does look better as well, actually looking at the before and after. That looks clean. Uh, and of course, the GMBN sticker on the mudguard. Good work. But yeah, thanks for uh, representing the GMBN sticker on there. That's cool to see. Um, so I'm guessing you've got a jersey or a t-shirt from our store, which is even better, so nice work. And I've just noticed you've put a little YouTube link in down here, so I'm just gonna have a quick look at that because I didn't see this before. 
Ah, oh, nice, so it's a link to your own YouTube page. In fact, we're gonna give you a little big up. We're gonna put your link to your own YouTube page in the description below our video. So if you wanna see all the stuff that Steven's been up to, have a look. Quite a cool looking channel by all accounts. Okay, next up is from Tim in the Netherlands. Hi guys, loving the show. I wanted to show you these plus 43 caliper adapters uh, that I custom CNC machined myself. Aha, oh, dude, this is cool. Hope you like them. Um, if you like, you can ask me anything about them. Yeah, how did you make them? How long did it take? How much did the material cost? All of that stuff. I think this is ace. And is the machine at work? Is it your own machine? Um, tell us more. I think this is really cool and they look really neat as well. You can always uh, send us one if you fancy as well. Quite, quite happily run one of those, they look cool. Yeah, drop us an email at uh, hellotech at gmbn.com and tell us a bit more. I think this is really cool. Um, definitely inspiring for other people to want to make stuff, especially if you've got access to cool tools like that. Um, wicked. Nice one, Tim. Thank you very much. Okay, now the last one this week, this is this is a next level top mod. Right, so the picture on the screen now is Dennis's uh, Specialized Enduro 2013 SE model. I've upgraded about everything I can on the bike. One by SRAM drivetrain, 1046 Monica set, Hope, M4 brakes, Chris King hubs. <whistles> Very nice, I'd like a set of those myself, really nice hubs. Um, original rims, race face turbine dropper post, Formula 35 fork, TF tuned Fox Float X shock, um, but I'm still stuck with the original dull paint scheme. So I decided to repaint the bike by lightly sanding the original paint as it was still really good. Um, I really like the way uh, squid bikes paint their bikes, but I don't have those skills, so I found a nice sticker which I used. The colour I used is a dark metallic orange, normally found on a 2013 mini convertible. Yeah, look at these shots, this is so cool. There's a custom job, you've done a really good job on there. I'm really impressed. It actually kind of follows form with some of the custom specialised bikes I've seen. It's like a really good effort, and the graphics do look cool. Loving those, I've not seen that sort of stuff before, that was great. Um, so squid bikes you say, I'll have to check them out. That's really cool. It's a really good effect as well. You've done that just right. You've not put too much on there. It's quite subtle, but it kind of pops at the same time. Last one, Dennis. Um, if anyone else has done any really cool mods, send them in. We'd love to see them. Thanks again. Okay, so tech of the week this week, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the evolution of suspension forks because I'm lucky enough to have in my hand from our friends at TF Tune Shocks here that I've borrowed a set of the original RockShox RS1s. Now this fork dates back to 1989 and it's basically the first proper suspension fork available for mountain bikes. So it's quite a dated design now when you look at this compared to modern suspension forks. Just for example, if I hold up this RockShox sorry, Recon, mate, sorry, look at... Sorry, what? I'm doing it again. I forgot to, Martin, seriously, why'd you, why'd you keep doing this, mate? What, is, what does he want this time? He wants to know what you're doing on Tech of the Week. Well, Tech of the Week's for our show. Yeah. Do you just want to do it just All to right, all right, one? all right. Martin, so basically what I'm doing this week on the show is looking at the sort of the RockShox RS1 and how it sort of progressed to a modern day fork. Look at the size of this thing. It's about like a third bigger in every, every respect. I mean, don't get me wrong, this isn't like um, comparable by uh, standards to the RS1 because that was a flagship fork at the time and this is the recon is very much a budget fork but just look at the difference of these things it's pretty cool isn't it and if you want to find out more sorry you're going to have to tune in to the tech show which airs on Monday evening to find out all about the RS1 and a bit of history it's a really cool product actually and I'm quite lucky to have this in my hand because they're extremely rare right okay should we carry on for us I think that's cool isn't it yeah right anyway so the RS1 was the first suspension fork and hilariously when this first came out people thought it was too much. They were like, two inch travel, you don't need all that on a mountain bike. The hilarity of it. So it's air sprung underneath these plastic caps, there's air valves in the top there. It's hydraulic operation and actually this model, even though it's not got much air in it, still compresses and it still feels quite smooth actually. Of course with the skinny little fork brace on there. It wasn't really up to much, there was a bit of flex and of course in the early days when these came out they did change your bike geometry quite a lot because they weren't making longer forks or frames of corrected geometry to suit suspension forks. So if you think if you put a fork two inches longer on the front of a bike it's going to jack up the head tube on there, give you a slightly higher BB, slacker seat angle, slacker head angle. However, all that rode it absolutely loved it. And Greg Herbold, who's one of the test riders, rode this to victory at the World Championships in 1990. So that was very, very cool. But what I especially like about them is 
look at the difference to com compared to like a modern day fork now. So the Recon is a 130 mm travel fork. This is like a 50 mm travel fork. So very, very different styles of fork, of course. But look, look at the size of it. And this fork actually, when you put it next to a Pike or a Lyric or a Fox 34, actually looks pretty skinny. Look at this thing, it's hilarious, it's so small. But actually, it's pretty amazing because this was the start of the suspension evolution. And once RockShox had got this on the market, the market got saturated very fast as everyone started releasing forks. And, and really, we have this fork to thank for all the amazing suspension products we have on our bikes now. So I'd like to say a personal thanks to Paul Turner for making this fork. This is awesome. Oh, and if anyone's got one for sale out there, especially with the pink decals, I'm in the market to buy one. I really want one of these for maybe to hang on the set on the wall or maybe for my own bike cave at home. I just love it, love everything it stands for. Super cool. That is my tech of the week. There we go, there's another weekly GMBN tech show in the bag. We loved having you along with us. Make sure you give it a like, give it a share, and if you want to see a couple more great videos, click up here for the Physique Shoe Unboxing. We're giving away five sets of those, so you definitely want to get involved with that. Free shoes for cycling in. And click down here if you want to see the Bike Build Pro Bike, where you can find out all the details about how to win that bad boy of a bike. I expect to see loads of entries to that competition from you amazing people, so get them in. See you next week.